This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Um, anyway, so I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Professor Chris Chinsky. He's one of the GSAP uh, science teachers. He Also uh, holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Dartmouth College and a PhD in physical science, physical chemistry from Stanford University. Uh, he's been here at Stanford since 1992 in the Department of Chemistry, and he's studied chemical bonding and promoting long distance tunnel, electronic tunneling across interfaces and contribute to the development of silicon and germanium surface chemistry. So that's a mouthful. So anyway, I'm really delighted to uh, introduce Chris. We're going to be talking about atomistic control and electric catalysis for energy-intensive applications. So welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming today. And um, this is really an experiment for me as well, because um, I usually give talks to chemistry audiences. And so you're actually a great um, uh, testing grounds. And I'd like to use today to fine tune uh, sort of at what level to talk about um, energy. Now, I know there's a lot of chemists in the audience, and so you, know, you can be picky. But I'm really interested in those of you who are engineers or, or scientists or otherwise interested in energy science. And uh, some of the, the chemistry here may, uh, you know, I may miss you. And if I do, I'd really like you to ask questions that uh, get me back on track with a broader audience and what would be most helpful to understanding uh, some of the opportunities that I think uh, we can see. So let's get this going. OK. Eventually that one. Yeah. All right. So um, what I'd like to give you a sense of is how, uh, what the opportunities are, how big the, the, the challenge, what often gets called grand challenges in, in science. Uh, of trying to do electrocatalysis. Just to give you a little bit of a feel, uh, the fuel cell was uh, originally developed around the same time as the internal combustion engine in the early 19th century, and it's gone practically nowhere since then. And that's with all due respect to those of you who are working on fuel cells. And, and the problem really, <laughs> including everyone in my, you know, who I'm associated with is in this room, and the problem really is that um, electrocatalysis, that is catalyzing chemical reactions so that you couple them to electricity, is a really hard problem. Um, and uh, I think that there's just an incredible potential opportunity to use atomistically designed uh, electrocatalysts. Atomistic design has now been used to make drugs. It's been used uh, to make specialty additives in all kinds of, of, of material systems. Um, it's being used uh, to, to in agricultural chemistry, um, and it's certainly used extensively in, in, in biochemical investigations. Um, but energy applications are very demanding, and they lead to, uh, in general, a lot of empiricism in optimizing how things work at the at atomic level. And so the, really the goal here is to see whether we can use um, uh, modern approaches to manipulating chemical systems to try to get at this age-old problem of why is it so hard to convert chemistry and, el and electricity, or to interconvert chemistry and electricity. OK, so um, the other people who have worked on this are Professors Dan Stack and Bob Weymouth, um, postdocs um, Zoe Otwelder, uh, Anando Devados, and Jun uh, Nakazawa, and then graduate students uh, Charles McCrory, Nick Conley, Ron Painter, David Pearson, uh, Matt Pello, and an undergraduate who, who made a, a nice little contribution that I'll highlight towards the end um, a couple summers ago. This is a project that's been going on for a while, and I'll, I'll try to give you some sense of, 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 of the various pieces that we're trying to get at. Um, so let me just give you a bit of an outline. Um, as I've said, I think there's a need to improve the interconversion of electrical and chemical energies. Um, the obvious application, the age-old application, is, is trying to make fuel cells something that will actually be broadly useful for mobile power applications. Um, in a simple sense, uh, fuel cells are, a, in principle, a great source of mobile power because you only have to carry around half the chemistry that makes, makes the power, carry the fuel, the oxygen comes for free from the air. 
Um, you can use, in principle, liquid fuels or fuels that are easy, fluid fuels that are easy to bring into the reactor and manipulate. Uh, that has a great advantage over batteries, where you have to sort of carry everything ready to go in a solid, um, in a solid uh, package. Um, uh, the next uh, application, uh, not quite so well appreciated broadly, is uh, that there's a real need to store electrical power that comes from intermittent sources. Until now, we've burned <coughs> fuels when and where we needed them. We had baseload power of burning a lot of, and we do have baseload power of burning co uh, coal, basically round the clock, and then we peak it uh, by burning natural gas when we need more electricity. Um, this leads to a lot of, of waste, and, uh, it, and we've wanted to replace it with sources that are more renewable like wind and solar. And the problem with those is they're not always on, and they're definitely not on exactly when you need them. So that brings up the problem of storage of electrical power. And the densest way to store energy is in chemicals, at least um, on, a, on a scale that we can imagine making happen on an hour-by-hour basis on this planet. Um, and um, so it would be nice if we could store uh, more electricity in chemistry. Um, batteries are, as you're probably well aware, not as good as they could be. Um, and, and then uh, the final area is chemical processing. A huge amount of the energy that's used in our modern economy goes into manipulating chemical bonds. And um, most of that is done with heat. And in many cases, it could be done, um, in principle anyway, electrically. But it's sort of the reverse of the fuel cell problem, which is um, that it doesn't end up being so easy to do because the catalysts are, are hard to come by. Um, in, Principle, this could lead to greener chemistry. Less energy uh, per unit chemical operation, less waste, less unwanted byproducts. Now, really the problem um, at a sort of basic level is making electrocatalytic processes reversible. You'd like the process you're trying to catalyze um, to be essentially brought to equilibrium by uh, the catalyst, and, or as close to equilibrium as possible. Um, if you can't quite get to equilibrium, then probably what you'll do is use a little more driving force, waste a little energy, uh, and you just like to minimize how much energy you have to waste, whether it be trying to get uh, some fraction of the energy out of a fuel um, in a fuel cell or putting uh, energy in and trying to drive a chemical reaction in some sort of chemical process. But um, an equally important uh, issue to keep in mind is selectivity. Uh, in some cases, you want to go to the thermodynamic minimum, and selectivity wouldn't be important, except that you don't want to chew up uh, your fuel cell and your catalysts and other assorted stuff. You don't want a lot of corrosion and other kinds of, of thermodynamic equilibration reactions to go on. So you certainly always want some selectivity with respect to the materials you're using to make things happen. But um, in many cases, uh, certainly... Um, in, in uh, the chemical processing arena, but also in arguably in certain uh, power storage applications, you don't want to go to the global thermodynamic minimum. You want to selectively get one transformation to occur and not others. And this leads to this concept of greener chemistry. A lot of things we want to make aren't necessarily the thermodynamically most stable form. Uh, we'd like to have a catalyst that rapidly equilibrates one reaction, but not globally equilibrates all. So selectivity is an important thing. And this is actually an area where I think atomistic control has its greatest opportunity. Um, finally, um, that leads to this question of how do you go about controlling catalysis at the atomic level, and not just in electrocatalysis, but more broadly in all of catalysis. That's a real challenge right now. That's a, it's an area where chemistry is really just beginning uh, to build up enough basis to, 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 to uh, be able to, uh, to have some predictability. Um, now, in the case of electrocatalysts, of course, you want to get electricity out, which means you have to have electrodes that somehow suck out or put in the electrons. And so this brings up the concept of heterogenizing homogeneous catalysts, which is a mouthful, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, and what we've done is to capitalize on a recently discovered reaction from about, oh, well, the beginning of this decade, um, which has come to be called the click reaction, and I'll say more about that in a little bit. But it's really a nice marriage with this notion of heterogenizing homogeneous catalysts, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, 
Clearly, um, a very important set of reactions are those involving oxygen, uh, dioxygen reduction, uh, which is the reaction um, that our cytochrome C oxi oxidase molecules do in our bodies. Um, that's uh, where we dump all the electrons from our food and put it into the O2 from air. Um, that same reaction turns out to be one of the hardest things about fuel cells. Um, so the reduction of the OO bond is a real problem, uh, and it has a lot of, of analogies in many other chemical problems. Um, and the opposite of that, oxidizing water or various forms of OH uh, to form OO bonds is um, our best source of electrons. It's our most ubiquitous source of electrons to do uh, chemistry, but uh, it's not an easy reaction to do. This is the reaction that green plants do to release O2. Um, and uh, the catalysts that do this in nature chew themselves up on a regular basis. It's a very tough reaction, and there's a lot of, of, of sort of corrosion, if you will, of the, of the machinery. Um, and finally, um, fuels. Uh, the oxidation of CH and CC bonds is, is the basis of most fuels, and certainly, I will argue, some of the best fuels we could imagine having. Um, but the opposite, the reduction of CO bonds to make the CC and CH bonds is the way that fuels got made in the first place uh, by photosynthesis. And we'd like to be able to do that as needed, and that's a very tough reaction, set of reactions. Okay, um, just to review for those who, who may not be familiar, um, the current sort of contender for uh, small scale or up to the size of, of potentially automobiles um, uh, fuel cell would be something that would operate near room temperature, wouldn't require you to cycle temperature up and down as you pull more energy out or turn it on and off. Uh, and so it's just a, a cartoon of how the polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell, uh, which is an ambient temperature up to maybe uh, 80 degrees C type, type of device, uh, works. Fuel is provided on one side of a membrane. That's this central um, yellow area. The membrane is capable of passing protons. The fuel is oxidized, forming um, oxidized products, which could be as simple as just protons, or it could be something like CO2 or uh, potentially something else. Um, but the protons then can move across the membrane, uh, where they can combine with oxygen atoms from O2 and electrons that were released when the fuel was oxidized, and, and they form products uh, which then uh, leave on, on this side. Um, water would be the simple product if it's just protons and, and oxygen. Um, and the electrons that are taken out of the fuel um, come out with a high chemical potential. They want to do some work. Um, so you let them run through a motor uh, to the low chemical potential of the electrons that are being sucked on by oxygen. And uh, in principle, you can get out um, over a volt in, the fa in favorable cases here, uh, a volt of electrical potential. Let's see, what, what's missing? What have I not said yet? Well, there's a need to allow f um, chemicals to come in contact with electrodes. And so the way this particular type of fuel cell works is that there are small particles of carbon black, which is a graphitic form of carbon, finely divided, uh, embedded in a uh, proton conductive ink. And um, the particles touch each other enough that when electrons are released from the fuel, they can be collected by, from particle to particle to particle and eventually go out through a wire and vice versa on this side. And then um, distributed on the carbon black are catalysts, and these are typically nanoparticulate metals, and that's one of the things we'd like to change, or at least look at, at more, more selective, more... Uh, engine, more atomistically controlled options. Um, and so on this side, we would have to have oxidation catalysts and then this side reduction catalysts for whatever reactions we're trying to, uh, to catalyze. Now, um, <clears throat> our notion is this and other fuel cells are, are, are well developed and they're continuing to be developed um, with existing catalysts. And so all we're really looking to do is take advantage of that chemical engineering that's in hand or will be in hand over time. Um, and it has a lot of benefits. People have worried really uh, substantially about things that I don't know very much about, like highly engineering the mass transport and the ion transport, um, uh, getting high surface area particulate electrodes, um, uh, developing all the electrical interconnects. And there's a lot of, of different aspects of that corrosion. And, 
and uh, minimizing the number of contacts and things like that. Um, developing uh, the fluid handling systems, air and fuel handling, as well as the cooling systems, because these things, at least as they're currently configured, generate a lot of waste heat as well as some useful energy. Um, and so you've got to cool them. And they also need to be controlled for water, because it turns out this whole thing depends on the humidity. It doesn't work if the humidity is not right. If you suck off water too rapidly, take away the product water, you dry the thing out. If you uh, let the water build up, it floods and the fluid handling breaks down. And all that stuff's been worked on um, and will continue to be worked on. So it's a, it's a nice platform on which to ask the question, if we could do a better job of catalysis, what would we want to do? And that's really just the, the challenge we've looked at, which is efficient and stable elect electrocatalysis in this and related types of, of geometries. OK, so um, you remember on the, on the left was fuels, and on the right was oxygen, and in between was this membrane. And, and a slightly uh, different take on that is to ask, what kind of voltage could you, in principle, build up across that membrane between the two electrodes? And uh, that's in blue. The, sort of the length of this bar is, is the voltage you can build up. And uh, there's a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of energy per electron that will be dissipated when uh, a fuel is reacted with dioxygen, whether it's in that cell or just burned. Um, and that's represented by the length of the total bar. And then the length of the bars on either side are the amount of that extra energy that comes out as heat due to the reaction at either the fuel electrode, the oxidation reaction, or at the oxygen electrode, the, the um, reduction reaction. And in the case of a hydrogen fuel cell, where H2 is the fuel, um, not very much of the free energy, the total energy available, is wasted as heat at the hydrogen oxidation electrode. That's a pretty good electrode. Um, and that reaction doesn't really need a better catalyst, though perhaps the catalyst, which is nanoparticulate platinum, is kind of expensive. But that's not where most of the expense is in the fuel cell. Most of it's over here, and most of the heat generated is over there. And the problem is that the best catalyst, commercial catalyst for this, which is also um, a platinum base, a nanoparticulate platinum material, um, uh, is not very good. And over a third of the energy comes out as heat, of the total energy available comes out as heat. And that's represented by this big red bar here. Okay. Now, partly that's wasteful, though not as wasteful as an internal combustion engine, which doesn't even generate anywhere near this much available uh, work. Um, but it's worse than that because this heat has to be removed from this device. And the heat is uh, only a few tens of degrees above room temperature. Maybe it's at 80 degrees on, you know, in a very well engineered, very well controlled system, you can let that get up to 80 degrees C. And that's just not a lot of temperature difference from the ambient to allow that heat to get out and not get, get out of control. So heat management becomes a big issue here. And I've actually heard people who have been working on some aspects of this, not the catalysis, say that the biggest problem here is all the engineering you have to do to manage that much heat. And it really adds to the cost of, of, of the devices, particularly in large scale applications. Um, OK, now hydrogen is an inconvenient fuel. Um, I think we have some inconvenient truths, and I think hydrogen is one of those truths is that hydrogen is an inconvenient fuel. So, you know, uh, <laughs> um, it's not, it wasn't very popular a few years ago. I think admitting that has become more, more acceptable. Um, uh, of course, normally hydrogen is a low density gas, and it doesn't have a very high energy density in that state. Um, it's expensive to make, and it's extremely expensive to transport. Hydrogen pipelines are significantly more expensive than natural gas pipelines, for instance. Um, and it's very hard to store. Um, you might want to store it by compressing it into tanks to put on the top of your car or something like that. You've seen, all seen pictures, I'm sure, of fuel cell propelled vehicles with these tanks on them and so forth. But um, the, the, the energy storage density is significantly lower, let's say, than just natural, than methane-based uh, fuels, which are not nearly as good as, say, propane-based um, uh, tanks, um, which is not nearly as good as liquid hydrocarbons. So it's, it's a problem. Methanol has been seen as the more convenient fuel for fuel cells, and so let's look at that. Um, methanol has a little bit less energy available during combustion per electron 
um, a lot more energy per molecule, but, but less per electron. Um, and that's because um, by, by putting this up, well, carbon oxygen, carbon hydrogen bonds, carbon hydrogen bonds don't carry quite as much energy as hydrogen hydrogen bonds against combustion. But it's still pretty good. The real problem, and it's got exactly the same problem over here because it's the same reaction, we're reducing O2. Um, but the oxidation of the CH bonds in methanol, and in particular, the final oxidation of the last CO bond to CO2, um, is a difficult reaction. And to get it to go reasonably fast at platinum, you need to, make, uh, you need to waste a lot of energy driving that reaction. And that generates a lot of heat um, uh, at, at, at that electrode. So now we're down to maybe a third or so of the available energy is, um, is available to do work. I think it's slightly better than that. But it's not a lot. Um, so um, what we really like are improved catalysts for both oxidizing fuels and reducing O2. Because we're seeing that both of these are causing us trouble. Now, while we're at it, um, let's, let's look at what really the best fuel would be. If you're going to go to all this trouble, what would you really like to use as a fuel? And the answer is, we'd like to use what we use today, um, particularly what uh, large transport vehicles in the military use when they really want something that's very, very convenient. They use either kerosene or diesel. Okay? And we're slowly shifting that way with our own cars. At, I'm afraid of some environmental damage in terms of little particles coming out the back of these new diesel cars. But, um, and the reason is that it's twice the energy density of methanol. Um, both on a volumetric basis and a mass basis. Um, it's water insoluble. Methanol, unfortunately, is not. It, it dissolves, and it's toxic, and it gets into the environment quite easily. Um, uh, by the time you get up to hydrocarbons as heavy as kerosene and diesel, you're talking about something with a low flammability and quite a low toxicity. Um, and there's a lot of existing production and delivery infrastructure, so we know how to handle this stuff. Um, and there's another advantage, which is that it's um, a big greasy hydrocarbon that's a lot easier to manipulate than methanol, which goes through aqueous pores in these, py in these uh, polymer electrolyte membranes. And the real bugaboo is there's, nobody's got a clue how to electrooxidize this stuff. So, um, but I will point out that this is, what, this is what plants and animals decided to do when they needed a really good way to have mobile power. And that's the stuff that we carry around with us around our wastes. Okay? This is long chain hydrocarbons. Um, and so right now, there is no way to do this. And even if you could do it on this side, you'd still be wasting this much on the oxygen side. So really, the, the big holy grail question is how much work can be obtained and how much heat could be avoided if you could do a, a more uh, systematic and controlled job of this electrocatalyst problem. OK, so um, we need to do oxygen reduction, even with the existing quite good hydrogen PEM cells. Uh, that's the big bugaboo. And that 30% of energy that's coming out as heat is, is a problem. Um, uh, methanol uh, as a fuel, uh, more convenient than hydrogen, but wastes another 25% of the energy. Um, uh, higher alcohols and hydrocarbon electrocatalysts are not significant contenders at this point. Um, so the goal is faster rates of reaction with less wasted energy, less what we electrochemically call the over potential. That is the energy you have to push the reaction with to get it to go at a reasonable rate. And that energy just comes out as heat. Um, and um, we'd like to figure out how to do this in all the various steps that would be necessary, both in O2 reduction, which may seem like a simple reaction, but actually it's a very difficult reaction. And, has several steps, many of which can be problematic, and hydrocarbon oxidation, which is a much more difficult reaction and has many, many steps. Um, and to do this, I think what we need is to look for new chemistries. And people have been at this for a while. This is not an easy problem. Um, but I think that's the nature of really challenging problems in science. And this may not be solved anytime soon. But I think it really is a fertile, fertile grounds for, for new solutions. Um, now, just to briefly hit on the other topics, um, in the case of storage of intermittent electricity, current battery, battery storage reactions uh, involve heavy rea and actually fairly expensive reactants. 
So the three big contenders are lead acid batteries, been around for a very long time, have worked for many applications, certainly starting our cars. Uh, they back, they've backed up the old telephone system for decades. Um, <clears throat> And they've been used in solar, um, remote solar installations for decades. Um, they work well. They're heavy. Um, and um, uh, they're not cheap, uh, you know, in terms of the, the cost of material. Lithium-ion batteries, significantly more expensive, significantly lighter, still not light by the comparison with, um, with, with using a fuel-based uh, fuel power source. Um, another battery which is less well known it's, it's somewhere um, comparable to these two, but has a different set of characteristics. It's called the vanadium flow battery. This is based on a fairly concentrated solution of vanadium and sulfuric acid. And in this case, unlike these two, the uh, reactants and products are liquids. And so you can flow them through a, an electrochemical reactor, much like the fuels going through a fuel cell. Um, and you can store the products when you charge the battery, you can store tanks of liquid reactants. And when you discharge the battery, you can store the products ready to be recharged when you happen to have electricity available. So it's a very attractive battery um, in the sense that you separate the storage problem from the power uh, conversion problem. Um, and it's relatively cheap in terms of the materials, um, but it unfortunately is very heavy. Uh, this is the kind of thing you want to put in a sub-basement. Uh, you certainly won't, don't want to drive it around in your car. Um, but it's, I think, intriguing in as much as it suggests what you'd really like to see in energy storage systems, in electricity storage systems. You'd like to see something where as you use up the, the surplus electricity, you're storing very conveniently a lot of high-density um, fuel, chemical storage of energy, and then can get it back relatively easily. So generate high energy, uh, high energy density liquid products from inexpensive reactants. And really, that's the reverse of a fuel cell. Um, generate liquid fuel when electricity is plentiful. Use it when it is not. And if we were really, really lucky, we'd figure out how to do photosynthesis in reverse. We t I mean, photosynthesis, but with electricity or, or photoelectricity if we have uh, photovoltaics running. Uh, take electricity, CO2, and water. Make something like a hydrocarbon, like the fat that we produce. Um, when we're storing ener excess energy and uh, release O2. Now, this releasing O2 is one of the hard part problems in the, this has sometimes been called, or versions of this have been called the hydrogen economy. And it's really a misnomer because the H part of this is actually not hard. Uh, there are some catalysts to handle moving H around. The real problem is getting the electrons out of O and getting them into the CO bonds. And, um, Producing O2 is, is a tough, tough challenge. It's even harder than reducing O2 in the fuel cell. Um, and, and so I, I really think that we should look at this as where are we going to get the electrons for, for, from to create fuels in a sustainable uh, energy economy. And we certainly in, appreciate the benefit of fuels as storage media, but and, and especially for mobile applications, but also for this uh, transient electricity storage application. It's just we don't have a good source of electrons to charge up. You know, where are we going to get the electrons from that we want to charge up with our available electricity? OK. Um, now, the final area was green chemistry, or chemical transformations powered by electricity. Again, this could be a place to take surplus electricity when you have it, when the sun's shining, when the wind's blowing, um, when the tides are turning, whatever. Um, and, and just taking that PEM fuel cell and thinking about what else could you do with it, um, it's worth pointing out that important, one of, of several important commodity chemical transformations of, of petrochemicals is to take carbon, carbon double bonds and under various conditions react them ultimately with water and removal of electrons, and that's usually done by some fairly expensive uphill procedures, and make things like glycols ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, more complicated uh, glycols in, in, in lower volume as you get to more complicated materials. And there's a lot of energy and uh, other waste that's generated in doing these kinds of transformations by uh, current methods. And people are always looking for better ways. But I'll point out one of the problems. If you let this go to equilibrium, you're going to get CO2, not what you want. 
which is a partially oxidized, very valuable organic molecule. This is the basis of, of um, lots of different um, specialty polymers and, and commodity polymers. So um, how, do you, how would you make this particular transformation go? You'd like to find a way to use just enough driving force for this oxidation under conditions where it's selective. And you'll pull out what turns out to be two electrons and let two water molecules uh, attack this double bond, creating the desired glycol and two extra protons. And what do you do with those two protons and two electrons? Well, you could, um, let, you could pump the electrons up and on this side make hydrogen, which is a somewhat valuable, that's the hydrogen economy, somewhat valuable byproduct. Um, or in principle, you could put O2 on this side and let the electrons fall down doing some work on the way to O2 and make water uh, on the other side. So there, there, there's some options there. Um, I mentioned that, that the issue here is really um, reversibility and selectivity. Um, we want to reversibly catalyze the desired reaction, or as close to reversible as possible. That will minimize the amount of work that we need to do, how much electricity it's going to take, electrical power it's going to take to drive the reaction. Um, but it also minimizes the amount of heat we have to throw away in that process. And we want to selectively catalyze only the desired reaction. Um, and selectivity, um, it, 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 in the very least, it minimizes wasted reactants. We make what we want and not a lot of other stuff. But more importantly, I think, it actually minimizes um, purification. And purification ends up taking up a lot of both energy and environmental resources. Um, in the case of the reaction I just talked about, I've been told by the folks at Dow um, that at least as classically practiced, most of the energy and most of the environmental impact of this is not in the chemical steps, which are much more complicated than I've outlined here. There's a whole lot of steps, um, unfortunately, involving dichlorine for some of these transformations. But what's worse is the product comes out impure. And to get it pure, you need a lot of heat to do various purification, uh, heat-driven purification steps. And you end up with a lot of wastewater, which isn't 100% pristine after it's been involved with all these chlorinated organics. So from an environmental point of view, there's a big payoff if we can do more selective transformations um, that require, therefore, less purification, less waste streams, and of course, less energy wasted in the purification processes. OK, um, now, what, what might you do to control things at an atomistic level? Um, well, many industrial catalysts are, are heterogeneous. This means, it, 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 certainly, it means that they're separate in a separate phase from the reactants. Um, there is often a distribution of different not quite the same reactive sites on these heterogeneous uh, materials. Um, these are often nanoparticles on a porous oxide support, though there are other types of heterogeneous catalysts. And the rate and selectivity of these things are usually, though not always anymore, um, only empirically optimizable. You change things, but you, it's hard to know in a systematic way what that change is exactly going to do. Um, for instance, the size of nanoparticles matters a lot, and that's not something that's easy to predict in advance or to get good control over. Sometimes you just have to take what you get. Um, many fine chemical analysis uh, catalysts, on the other hand, are homogeneous. And I'll give an example in just a second. Um, these are usually in the same, well, by, by definition, they're in the same phase as the reactants. That leads to a separations problem. Um, they're often... Um, and hopefully always, a single type of reactive site. One of the advantages to going to something that you're going to dissolve in or suspend in with your um, reactants is that you can specify it more precisely. Um, and typically, that's a well-characterized molecule, though it could be some kind of a complex of molecules. Um, and the rate and selectivity can much more readily be tailored at the atomic level because you actually typically have the structure of what it is that's um, doing the reaction. Here's an example. Um, we had a speaker some time back, um, uh, Bob Crabtree from Yale. And uh, this is a famous molecule that, that he was responsible for. Um, and here are, uh, is the hydrogenation of a double bond just to make CH, two extra CH bonds. Okay? 
Um, this is a fairly complicated molecule, but it just points out this question of selectivity. Um, this is actually a very fast catalyst, but much more importantly than its speed, um, as compared, for instance, with palladium nanoparticles on carbon, is its selectivity. So uh, this molecule has a particular shape. I haven't drawn it, but basically this double bond can be approached from one of two sides. And um, uh, when you do that with palladium um, nanoparticles, uh, you get some preference for one of the types of approach. Um, but if you use this catalyst, it's almost exclusively the opposite. Uh, and that can be tailored. That can be arranged to be selected for different features of the molecule you're trying to transform. So that's, a, that's an attractive feature of homogeneous catalysts. Let's see, did I, uh, yeah. So homogeneous catalysts have lots of problems with them. And it would be nice to heterogenize homogeneous catalysts. That is, take all the good features of homogeneous catalysts, but stick them onto a porous high surface area support. So covalently attach these molecular catalysts to a high surface area porous solid support, and um, then have separate phases that allow easy separation of the catalyst from the products. And in the case of a homo uh, heterogenized homogeneous electrocatalyst, uh, you want to choose electronically transmissive linkers when you link this molecule to the catalyst, I mean to the substrate, to, to the su support. That needs to pass electrons readily. And you want to choose corrosion resistant conductive porous supports. Okay, so here's just an example, uh, sorry, of something that we've been working with. Um, it's a very simple molecule. It catalyzes the reduction of O2, not terribly well, but well enough to be interesting to study. And we've linked it through uh, this somewhat unusual linker called a triazole to the graphene sheets of graphite, which is the electrode uh, used in, in, uh, in the PEM cell and in, in many, many other commercial electrochemical applications. So um, let's just see kind of how we got there. Um, Ananda Devados is in the audience, and I sat down and thought about this, and we said, oh, good, good chemist, we know. Uh, you can nitrate with nitric acid aromatic systems. So graphite should look like this, sort of, at the edges of the graphene sheets. We should be able to do this, and we know we should be able to set, separate them out, because once you nitrate once, it's harder to put on another nitro group. So TNT, trinitrotoluene, you have to push it really hard to get those three nitro groups on there. Um, so that should be good. That should allow us to spread these things out. Then we should be able to reduce this and make amines. And we should be able to convert amines, for instance, uh, with acid chlorides to, 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 um, uh, to amides. And we should try doing this kind of thing. And, and we tried lots of these kinds of things. We tried other reactions like this. We inevitably found that at each step, we had evidence that it was working. And we also had lots of other stuff happening. So there's a real problem in trying to covalently derivatize solid substrates, which is that um, you often get multiple products, and there's no way to purify once something's stuck to a solid surface. You can't go in there and separate the good stuff from the bad stuff by distillation or something like that. Um, what, um, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was this reaction. We wanted to somehow get to this species called azide on the surface. And then this reaction, which had been discovered um, independently um, by the Sharpless and Meldahl labs back at the beginning of the decade, um, which is a room temperature reaction between two sort of high energy species, acetylene and azide. And it's catalyzed by copper one. Um, and it forms this triazole. We wanted to get to that kind of chemistry because we knew this was a very high yielding reaction. If we could have a good sample of this and a good sample of this, then we would get pretty much 100% what we want, that. And this is kind of an interesting connector because it's both chemically quite stable and it's electronically quite transmissive. So if we had our catalyst up here and we needed to get electrons in and out of it, this would be a good choice. So this reaction, I won't go through. It's got a lot of advantages. I'm just going to say it's a good reaction. Um, now here's the interesting part. Uh, after playing around with all kinds of established chemistry, a reaction which I would have told Anando not to try, um, but he didn't bother to tell me when that was a good thing. Um, he tried it. And that was to add iodine azide to the graphene surface. And, and the reason I, said, I would have said don't do this is because it's known that iodine azide doesn't add to aromatic systems. It only adds to double bonds that are not part of a benzene ring. But 
Sometimes it's good to just try stuff anyway, and it worked. And not only did it work, but it didn't even give the expected product. The expected product would have an iodine right here and not have a double bond right there. And that had been OK, but it's even better what we got. It appears that we lost the iodine somehow, and we ended up with just the azide part on the surface, probably with a double bond here. And then just as expected, that, that works. So this turns out to be a really easy reaction, and it's got a very clean product. It's actually just as simple as making this stuff up. This is explosive, so you have to make it up as a dilute solution. Making this stuff up in a dilute solution, dipping in the graphite and for a few minutes at room temperature, taking it out, and then rinsing it off, and you're ready to do the next reaction. Um, I won't go through the characterization. I'd be glad to go through these details with anyone who's interested. Um, it's hydrolytically quite stable. We've looked at the surface and seen how it tolerates abuse. It's a quite a stable linkage. Now, what might we do with this? And so let me just briefly tell you about, um, and then I'll quit, tell you about um, uh, trying to think about how we might do what nature has learned to do. Now, you know that we have an enzyme that reduces O2, uh, that cytochrome C oxidase. It doesn't do a terribly good job. It's part of what keeps us warm. Um, but there is an enzyme that does a very good job. It's called lacase. It was derived not for getting energy out, as it, I think, tells us something. It was derived for a chemical reaction that was really difficult to do with O2 unless you could use every bit of oxidizing power of O2. Um, and uh, so there are many different versions of these lacases, but some of them are very good at, um, at, at, at getting electrons all the way down into O2 at it you know, O2 as an electron acceptor, using every ounce of that drop into O2 and not having to waste a lot of energy pushing the electrons into O2. Um, for instance, a fuel cell has been made by the Heller Group at University of Texas, and uh, it has a very small wasted over potential of about seven, uh, 70 millivolts. And that's to be compared with what we were looking at in, at the beginning of the talk, which is about 370 millivolts in the platinum fuel cell. Oh, how does this thing work? Well, as far as we know, there are these three copper atoms. They have a kind of a, an empty space, probably occupied by water, in between them. O2 comes in, binds there, and electrons start pouring into the O2, ripping it apart, and the reaction goes very smoothly. So this suggests that copper has some interesting um, opportunities, and Professor Stack in the chemistry department is an expert in copper, and so we thought we'd look at this. There had been some previous work with a very simple copper complex, Fizzy-sorbed on graphite turns out to do this reaction. We wanted to look at that in more detail. Um, the overpotential is large. Um, here it is. Uh, the overpotential is something like 800 milli electron volts, significantly worse than platinum. There's the parent compound when copper is in it. The current or a number of oxygen turnovers per copper atom per second uh, drops off as you go towards the thermodynamic reversible potential, which is way out here. And um, different derivatives, a little better. Um, we've tried to understand what makes this work. And let me just jump ahead. We've gone ahead and made a similar compound using the click chemistry. And here's just a picture of this. And I'll, I'll kind of end it with this. Um, uh, we've been able to change the nature of this ligand that holds onto the copper atom. And um, we've used a lot of different things that are just fizzy-sorbed on graphite. That's probably not a stable, technologically useful solution, but it's a model system. And then we've done something that gets closer. We've clicked, using this click chemistry, covalently attached a ligand, and then asked, where does it fall in this family of related ligands? And interestingly, even though it's covalently attached to the surface, it falls within one of the two families falls very close to this family, which we call the electron withdrawing trend. I can go into that for those who are interested in the chemistry. And, and what it's telling us is that having attached this thing to the surface, it acts as if it were fizzy-sorbed, presumably in between the planes of the graphene sheet. So the details of how it's attached or how it's connected to the surface are quite different, but somehow it's behaving very similarly when it comes to the rate of catalysis. So um, I realize that I've, I've kind of burned up my time trying to figure out the intro to this. And I will end um, with, let's see, um, 
just an example of that same ligand used with a different metal for a completely different reaction. This catalyst, which involves similar ligands but palladium, um, has been in the hands of, a, of, of our other collaborator, the Professor Weymouth's group, um, used to produce very rapid oxidations of alcohols, at least rapid by the standards of, of homogeneous catalysts uh, to date for alcohol oxidations. And what we've learned is that it, it really depends on the nature of what's attached to the palladium other than this ligand. In particular, it needs to have a very easily removed ligand, that's this uh, fluorinated sulfonic acid, and um, a usefully basic ligand, that's acetate anion. And um, we're now in the process of trying to understand, can this simple a catalyst actually be electrochemically useful? Turns out, probably not. And to make it electrochemically useful, um, we're going towards, the Weymouth group is, is taking us towards compounds that involve now two uh, platinum group uh, elements, palladium or platinum, hope maybe eventually nickel compounds, that position the, the, the atoms very close together so they can form and make and break a metal-metal bond during electrochemical transformations. This turns out to be a big deal at making the coupling of, electric, of electrons to chemistry much more rapid and wasting a lot less energy. We still don't know exactly why that is, and this just sort of brings me to a nice place to end, which is to say there's a lot of mysteries left in chemistry, and I think that uncovering those will get us down the road towards better conversions between electricity and chemical energy, and I think that has a lot of opportunities for the long term. I'm not promising anything in the next 10 years, but I think we're going to learn a lot about how we can make those two realms talk to each other in a much more sophisticated way. With that, I'll end and apologize if I've run over a couple minutes. I'd be glad to take any questions. And I particularly um, like a sense of what you may not, those of you who aren't chemists, what may have left you going, huh? Yes. Um, so it's really nice talk to you today. What I'm just curious about the a lot of biologically inspired kind of um, catalysts. And did you, did you have any idea of um, when you were measuring how efficient it was or, or if it worked or not, if they were getting eaten off in the process? That's a great, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we haven't worked with so let me go back to that work, yeah, right here. We haven't worked with this, um, lig this um, enzyme ourselves, though um, it's used in non-electrochemical applications commercially. Um, it's, it's used as a commercial oxidant, actually, with O2 uh, for oxidizing various things, just for the reason that nature invented it. And um, so it's been harnessed technologically, and it has a lifetime that's significantly long compared with the cost to isolated. So even though it's a pretty big molecule, lots and lots, I mean, so big that you don't see all the atoms in that structure, um, it, it is actually used as a commercial oxidant or catalyst for oxidation. O2 is the oxidant, and, and, and it sucks electrons out of things and dumps them into O2. So um, that part's known. I don't remember, though perhaps someone in the audience does, what Heller may or may not have said about the lifetime of these. He had so much of this stuff on the electrode that I think it would have taken a while to see it all go away. But I don't know if Charles or Dan wants to remembers anything more about that. Lifetime of the, of the enzyme? I know they looked at it for three, they don't see it for three or five days. So yeah. They did multiple yeah, I mean, I guess my instinct is that there's a lot of pieces that can go bad in something that complicated. Um, and though it works um, as a as a catalyst for bulk oxidations, those aren't situations where it's being recycled over and over and over again as it would be in a fuel cell. So um, I know others, including DuPont, have looked at this possibility for fuel cells. I haven't seen any recent work that suggests that it's taken off. Other questions? Yeah. Is that a um, it's a um, uh, beta. Uh, let's see. I'll get this right. Um, th these are beta sheets, and they've come together to form a barrel. 
uh, with ligands pointing in that hold the coppers in the middle. Is that approximately right, Dan? Good enough? Okay. Yes, Anders. So, so, so when it comes to the oxygen reduction reaction, which is really tricky one, as you pointed out, so far no oxygen has been able to do anything better than nitrogen. And uh, so what do you think is the key in a way? Uh, what what would we need really to do in order to have something that can compete for that? Right. Is it in a way that we want to hydrogenate so to the floor to associate with the bottom? Or what what is the the key step in order to really find something that actually could compete for that? So so there's been a lot of work with with various transition metal catalysts to reduce uh, O2, and this is now over quite some time. And a lot of that is sort of captured in this mechanism, even though this isn't the, the lots of other transition metals in different ligation environments have been looked at. This is by far the best catalyst there is for the reduction of O2. I, I don't think that anybody's. In fact, there's some open question as to whether this might actually be reversible, though I'm not sure there's any strong evidence for its reversibility. But it's close enough that, you know, you can imagine this reaction maybe with some biological evolution that would actually. Uh, not only reduce O2, but make O2 from water, uh, depending on which, how strongly you drove the electrons in or out. So let me just go over what, what's important here. It looks like you start with reduced copper, which means that these coppers um, must really want electrons uh, badly. So even at the potential of the O2 electrode, they have electrons on them. Um, and then oxygen binds by accepting two electrons, or maybe it's just one electron the first time it binds, to form some reduced O2 species, like superoxide or peroxide dianion, superoxide monoanion or peroxide dianion. And those are anions, so they need to be stabilized by some cations. But you've just created some extra positive charge, and the site was probably positively, ever, all appearances from the crystal structure are, that it's positively charged to begin with. So this is not a bad place to be creating anions. And they will be stabilized by, by um, ligand interactions with the metals. And then the question is breaking the OO bond. And it appears that part of what's important there is making sure that as the OO bond breaks, and this has been studied in a lot of detail by the stack group and many others, and not an area that I've worked on a lot, but um, breaking the OO bond in these kinds of co multi-copper complexes um, requires an environment where as the, o, as the OO bond breaks, it moves smoothly into a nice oxide bonding environment. So you go from a peroxide-like or superoxide-like species to an oxide-like species, breaking the OO bond with a relatively small barrier. And you can kind of see, I'm not sure this is the right uh, sort of intermediate to draw here. No one has got a crystal structure of the intermediate. Uh, all they really know is how these guys are laid out in the, in the protein crystal structure. Um, but in any case, this bond is breaking and maintaining probably at least two coppers coordinated to each oxygen. So I think that's the key to doing this. And I think that um, it's nice to be able to do it with metals that don't form super strong oxygen metal bonds, because then you can get it back off. You can protonate it off as water and start over again when you pro provide more electrons. So that would be my thoughts on your question. I think there's a proof of principle here. If we could have an industrial, if we had a commercial electrocatalyst that had 70 millivolts of overpotential, you know, we'd be really excited. We don't. Yeah. Does the contrast the um, job of busting a bond of hydrogen fuel? If you're you know, anything more complicated than methane, you have at least two different kinds of chemical bonds. You envision catalysis that would have different catalysts on the same electrode for different sets and more complicated fuel? Or? Um, well, that's one of the nice things about homogeneous catalysts is you could, in principle, mix them together and co-localize them on the surface, so long as there was enough lability that the, that the intermediate species could leave one catalyst at some dissociation concentration and get themselves stuck to the next catalyst. Certainly, biology works that way all the time. And things like fat um, metabolism, the oxidation of hydrocarbons in our bodies, is carried out by a whole series of different enzymatic steps. Um, so I think that that would be a reasonable strategy, but who knows? You could hit the jackpot and find something that not only breaks CH bonds, but breaks CC bonds, and not only does that, but it goes from carbon monoxide to CO2, which you may know is another really big challenge. 
So there are at least three really hard reactions in hydrocarbon oxidation, and I'm not banking on them all happening at one, you know, one site. Okay. What industry did you say that this was found in and this was being used? Uh, it's being used, I believe, in paper uh, pulp, pulp bleaching. Is, this is used. But I think um, maybe, maybe Dan remembers. There are several other applications for lacases. Blue jeans are... Uh, I think it's in laundry detergent, actually. Um, but I'm, I, I don't want to go on record with too much of this. So. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.